Thank you so much for coming. Um, this, is a, this is a topic that we feel is extremely important and Matthias and I have been thinking about it and acting on it for the last year or so. And um, the story that we're about to tell you um, prompted us both to create presentations for different situations based on the same material, and we've both done those a few times and, um, and, and been relatively well received. Now we have smashed those two presentations together. Barbie and Oppenheimer. Right, so, <laughs> so, so you get 90 minutes of presentation in 45 minutes, effectively. Um, and the, um, the pragmatic and the angry stuff, that's mostly mine. And the visionary, hopeful stuff, that's mostly his. Yeah. Right. And any of you who know me, I'm sure that fits. Um, right, so thank you so much for coming to our session. This is where I work, uh, Open Strategy Partners. I've co-founded it with Tracy Evans, who's sitting there in pink. And uh, we help digital agencies technical product companies and open source projects communicate strategically and effectively so that they can communicate, connect, and grow. Um, I work with a genius. She's amazing. Uh, all the smart ideas in the company are hers. Um, Tracy has a deep strategic background in business. I have had several thousand beers with people like you um, in open source and technology. and. Um, we put that together to be a strategic communications company. Our very good friend and part-time team member, Matthias. That's me. Has transitions in his slides. I do. I'm from outside Oslo. And right. I can press the button too. Oh, this is cool. I'm currently in New Zealand. Uh, and I have a wife and two kids. And I've been doing Typo 3 since 2003. And I'm in the Typo 3 Association board, which is not boring. I'm also an open source evangelist at Tuju, and as Jam very well said it, I'm also a communication consultant at OSP because they need it. <laughs> <laughs> and another, another thing I'd like to point out about um, OSP is that we work with Drupal clients, with Typo3 clients, um, with Sulu clients, those are all open source CMSs. We also work with training companies, hosting companies, and other technology organizations. But, but now, now you've said Typo3, I think, three times, so now you can change slide, because people are like, what is Typo3, right? Uh, so Typo3 is uh, very uh, simply explained. It is a PHP-based CMS. Never heard about that. It is free and open source. It is community driven and it's backed by an association never heard about that either does this sound familiar <laughs> yeah and it has a long history we're actually 25 years uh this year yeah what 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 does that sound like here you know well if you look below the surface of type of three it sounds you know well look, look at this is drupal drupal 10 if you install Drupal 10, you have 54 uh, dependencies, composer dependencies. Next, Type of 3 version 12 came out this year as well, has 98 composer dependencies. That isn't really important. Uh, we do things slightly differently, but we actually have 33 composer dependencies in common. So even though we do things in different ways, we're actually really quite similar. Still though, yeah, we're similar. Typo 3 slides have too many clicks in them. That's a big difference. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Still though, we tend to, you know, say that, well, Typo 3 is better than Drupal, or Drupal is better than Typo 3. But that's really not the way we should think. We do have those 33 composer dependencies in common, and there are much bigger things in the sky, the dark clouds and all of that, that actually should lead us to collaborate, which yeah. we're actually doing. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I like to say that around the turn of the last century, two sets of kids were given the same set of Lego bricks and told to solve the web publishing problem. And um, you have very interestingly different and very interestingly the same solutions with Typo3 and Drupal. So fundamentally we're friends and we're gonna get into that more, but the, one of the biggest themes of this talk is that we need to present a unified front as open source projects and business solutions before we start competing with each other because the world sees us as open source first. And how many times have you been told, I tried open source, it didn't work for me? Yeah, I mean, I met a guy earlier this year who actually said, you know, I tried open source once, it didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's how people relate to open source. It's a brand, right? Whatever happens in open source, if it's good, it's good for everyone. If it's bad, it's definitely bad for everyone because the proprietary world can say, oh, just look at open source, they can't do security. Yeah, yeah. yeah. there you go. So, so um, I had a big scare at the beginning of this year that I'm about to reveal, and um, it prompted us to passionately agree that we all as open source practitioners and practitioners and business people need to remember why and how we're special and remember to tell the world about that because there are always new people assessing technology, always people making new technology choices. And what we do is genuinely special and genuinely weird and genuinely a little bit tricky to explain to people who live in the regular economy of scarcity. Yes, I mean, we actually don't learn about open source in school. Open source is a totally new and different way of working. And I think we talk a little bit too little about that. Right, so in a nutshell, we think that for the last few years, we've remembered freedom and we've forgotten about the responsibility part mm -hmm. of open source. So. Since about 2008, everyone I know in open source has been really busy. And we've been founding companies, and we've been at 120% capacity, and we've been working really hard, and we've got government contracts, and we've got private sector contracts, and we've been doing great. Successful. And we haven't needed, we haven't felt that we really needed to talk about it. We got quite complacent, right? And um, along comes January Ooh. 31st this year. And um, somebody sent me this article <laughs> at an inconvenient time of day. Um, so, anyone uh, know GovCMS in Australia? It's amazing. It's Drupal. I was a um, very small part of the team that originally got it going in Australia back in the day. It's been through the hands of several service providers. It's wonderful. It's built on Drupal. Um, a, somebody got the right meeting in 2020 and... Um, uh, essentially convince someone in the Australian government to ignore the massive infrastructure that they've built on open source and the massive investment that they've made in their own country with their own money and uh, given contracts to Deloitte and Adobe uh, worth more than $80 million to create a DXP with personalization, right? Even though... Um, the GovCMS already serves 133 uh, departments in the federal government. It fully runs two state governments. It's a fully open source distribution. I mean, the prices you can win in the buzz buzzword bingo today. Yeah. So um, it turns out, right, not only that, but the personalization of the, the, of the DXP that one of the departments um, got sold on, um, was illegal under Australian data privacy and protection laws. They were not allowed to do, and this is government people who spent, um, as of the beginning of this year, um, 35.6 million Australian dollars on illegal functionality. Super cool. I got super upset. Australia has an incredible success story for us as Drupal and open source practitioners. Um, so Matthias and I concluded that um, this has been most of us complacent in our success, 
right? This is good, we've got the work, it doesn't matter. Um, even though the Australian government has been using free and open source software, the procurement people aren't aware of what they're using and they, they, don't, they don't know why. Now, it's not their job to know why, but I think it's our job to make sure that people know. We have to talk about open source. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, if you, what, if you, what if you phrase it, it seems to me that it's an odd decision to send Australian taxpayer money to an American company for their proprietary software, right, when you could invest it in your own country and in your own economy. So anyway, let's talk for two minutes about how things used to be, how things really used to be. Flashback to 2001 and a Microsoft um, senior executive called open source an intellectual property destroyer, right? And um, I, you know, I can't imagine anything worse for the software business. <laughs> yeah, so, so, um, so that was fun, and we had a lot of fun with this for a long time, and, and, and Microsoft now actually does really pretty darn well with open source. Um, I have a friend whose job is fully open source, full time, with, um, with Microsoft, right? So this is how things were, and this is how we were feeling, and you know, this is all the complacency. Like, hey, we won. We won. It's cool. Um, but, you know, uh, as I said, I think we've forgotten what's weird and forgotten what's important about what we do. So, Matthias and I talked this through, and we want to run you through what should be a recap for everyone. So we're gonna talk about the four freedoms, what they mean. I'm gonna talk about the consequences and all the job that I used to do as open source evangelist at Acquia, and how to close deals and how to sell open source and all that stuff. I wanna to touch on all that. We still need to do it but it should be familiar to you. And then um, Matthias, is, um, Matthias has some much bigger ideas that, that are, are stunning and astonishing and beautiful. Magic and idealism and pink and all of those things. <laughs> yes. So, so um, let's get back to the basics for a second, right? We have, um, we have four freedoms and they, they have a really fa fantastic value proposition. And so now you'll notice from the font and the format of my old slides, right? I'm pulling this out of the archive, um, right? We're free to use open source for anything, anywhere and forever, and no one can take, us, take it away from us and no one can change the price on us. Awesome. And we're all free to open it up and we're free to understand if we think it's secure and if it'll do what we um, need it to do. We're free to ask our friends or service providers for help to change it and make it exactly what we need it to be. That's awesome. And not only that, when we've created the perfect solution to whatever our challenge is in our industry and vertical, we can build a business on that. We can give it all away. We can uh, give it to the community. These are our four freedoms. It's love, basically. Right. Now, this is where um, there's a very uh, interesting podcast called Open Source Utopia, and it's very, very short episodes, and they have titles like Open Source is Love, and um, what's the magic wizard one? Oh, there's lots of magic in them, actually. Right. But they're uh, only two and a half minutes long, so if you have a very short way to your office, which most of us have when we have home <laughs> office, for... this is what you can listen to. Oh, this is for your... Yeah. <laughs> Matthias created it during yep. the pandemic for the pandemic commute from the toilet to the desk. Yeah. Um, so Open Source Utopia is utterly fascinating. And when Matthias showed me the scripts that he was developing, and I was very flattered that you asked for my input on them, um, I said, amazing, because he thinks about open source in ways that I never had. Um, and it was a really, it was a growing experience for me because I, I didn't want to impose my perspectives on it. I really wanted to learn. And so anyway, open source utopia is super weird and really, really, really interesting. And we're going to touch on some of those themes in a bit. So um, we have freedom. Yahoo! I'm free. Freedom! Yeah, we can um, run around. We can do whatever we want. Right. So, and the classic freedoms um, are free as in beer, right? You can have it. And it's free as in speech. You can use it for whatever you want, okay? Now, you also have freedom of choice. You can do anything you want with it. However, 
there's an interesting wrinkle here. Yeah, you know the story of the gingerbread boy? So, you know, you have these two parents who really, really want a kid, and they can't have it. For some reason, maybe they don't know how, maybe it's some other thing limiting them. But anyway, they, what they do is that they make a gingerbread boy, put it in the oven, and once it's finished, they open the oven, and he pops out, and he says, hi, I'm here, and he runs out the door, and he meets lots of cool people, and that's basically what happens to an open source project. You know, somebody makes it, and then they open source it, and if they're lucky, somebody picks it up and does whatever they want with it. Yeah. And isn't that cool? Everyone can do whatever they want with it. Everyone else is also free to do whatever they want yeah. with it, right? Um, and then my favorite uh, conceptually is um, open source is free as in puppy, right? Here is a free puppy. Isn't it cute and wonderful? Doesn't it wag its tail just like you need? Um, but you have to feed it and water it and love it and take care of it, right? And, so and the same thing with the gingerbread boy. He actually gets eaten by the fox in the end. So there is something more to open source than just this dancing around being free. Right. So we feel that when we take, we feel that when we take on um, all this cool free stuff that tens of thousands of our friends have made for us over the last 20, 25 years, um, it comes with. Uh, responsibility. Um, freedom comes with responsibility and, and that's why we have all sorts of organizations and communities and customs around us. Um, so that was the four freedoms, the core of, of our practices and thinking. I want to jump through three or four quick examples of how we pitch open source as a business choice not as a moral choice, as purely pragmatic, it makes good sense to do this because you get more money more efficiently, do more things, whatever your mission is. So, um, we, open source, we've radically changed the economics of infrastructure and return on investment and cost structures and the potential value of information, right? Um, and, and we've done this in a bunch of ways. We've let people build their own perfect solutions and pass them on, right? Um, we've allowed people to spend their money different ways. So given these four freedoms, um, an early and powerful um, story that is probably obvious to all of us in this room, but not necessarily, and this is what I keep coming back to, we need to tell people about this, if you have a classic project with a budget of 100, it's an IT project. It's going to be expensive. If you're going to spend 100 money on IT, right, build a better project, right? Subtract license fees or seat costs or something um, from your project. And all of a sudden, maybe you get, you know, a better color of blue from your design team. Um, or you know you you get it on a better server, or you or you train some more staff, or you or you do better testing or something. You can spend the same money and you can get a better um, project out of it. Um, and you can. What's not here, and I think, um, is a very powerful story that we come to. You also choose where to spend your money, right? And you can spend it in your own economy. And you don't have to be a cheapskate, right? Right, right. Um, never sell open source as free to your clients because. IT projects cost money, right? Everybody has IT costs and personnel and housing, blah, blah, blah. But when the license fee is no rupees, I gave this talk in Mumbai. Um, you can invest, <laughs> you can inv I just noticed that, wow. Um, you can invest in your team um, and you can invest in what you need when you need it because you're, you've got thousands of vendors that can help you. You've got your own data. You, build, you get what you need when you need it. You, you don't have to ask Microsoft to please implement a feature, right? And, and so you get a, a, a better roadmap, a, an overall, just a better project. Um, little story that my dad used to like to tell. Um, I guess he still does. Um, you got to own the bricks. I don't want my government spending my tax money on infrastructure that it doesn't own. I really don't like the idea that um, a, a Oracle or SAP or pick your poison can say, hey, you've built this entire bit of digital infrastructure, um, but anywhere else it's not making enough money for us, so we're going to shut it down. 
or, right, but you are lucky because we will let you upgrade to version two, which we're releasing next year, which doesn't, it doesn't quite work the same and cost twice as much, but hey, what choice do you have, right? In the restaurant business, um, classically, you want a location where um, people will walk by and spontaneously walk in and be like, oh yes, I'm gonna have a drink or some um, nachos or something. Um, and once you're established and people know about it, they might come to you as a destination, they might call ahead, right, and make reservations, but you want, a, you, you want to have a great place. And when you're renting this place in the, in the pedestrian zone of your town and it's going great and you've been there for a year or two and your landlord comes and says, you guys are awesome and I love your nachos, you're doing great. Yes, we're doing great, isn't it great? Yes, I think so, I'm doubling your rent. Location is everything, what do you do? So, you gotta own the bricks, right? You need to buy the property to put your restaurant in to make that happen so that nobody can double the price or, or take the thing away from you, right? This is why, for example, our governments should really build their infrastructure on open source. Very old, very, very old slide. Um, people still ask us if uh, open source software is secure and we can talk about you know, any number of dozens of security experts looking at Drupal and Type 3 and other systems every day because they're implemented in governments around the world and you could objectively see that the code is secure um, and lots of people have said it out loud. Um, people still ask about this. So, um, so there are a few of the, of the sort of businessy things that we talk about. Now, Matthias began to really blow my mind when he started talking about um, open source adding value beyond this scope. I had thought about this far in different versions. Um, so beyond our daily work and business, uh, Matthias, please. Bring it on. Yeah. Yes, so very often when you have government projects, I can stand there and click the button if you want and you can stand on the other side. Smile, please. Um, generally, when you have projects with the government today, depending on what political flavor is in power, they either say, the government should do everything. The government should build the software, the government should own the software, the government should do its own thing. Or they say that, well, the government shouldn't do anything, the private sector should do everything, the private sector should own everything, and the government should just pay for it. The interesting thing, though, is that whichever political flavor it is in power, both of the solutions are actually proprietary. Either the government owns it or the private sector owns it. Well, where does open source come in? So, we have this amazing thing that happens be, you know, in the space that's left behind between government and private sector. It's called civil society. Civil society is basically another word for community. Oh, you might know community from before, but what is it actually that happens here? I have a wonderful analogy that I'm going to run for you. This, dear audience, is a desert. Uh, the desert is the example of the monolithic, the monoculture, the monotechnical. In this environment, The person with the power is the person with the watering hole, right? You can live pretty happy as long as you have money to pay that guy for your water, right? It's warm, it's dry, it's nice, you can sleep anywhere you want. But as soon as that guy decides not to give you water, you have a problem. And what you have as well is a dependency. You're suddenly dependent on somebody else. This is an example of open source. It shows collaboration. I mean, just imagine if, if, it was, if all trees here were the same type, that would have been a monoculture. It wouldn't have been a lot of freedom there. It would have been all the same. But what happens here is actually all of these trees are collaborating. All of them are actually working together to create a world where everyone can exist. It's a type of interdependence. 
it's not a freedom where everyone just does whatever they want, but they're actually dependent upon each other. And, you know, everyone has access, but everyone also has a responsibility. And if you want to do something here, you actually have to step up and do it. You can't wait for somebody else to do it for you. And in that way, you cannot survive without collaboration. Here's another picture of sand. You've been to the beach, right? <laughs> yes, it's sand. Uh, you've been to the beach, or you've been to a sand pit, or something, you know. If you pick up sand in your hand, what happens to it? It just runs between your fingers, and it's gone. That's how hard it is to deal with sand. What do we do if we have a desert and we want to stop it? Any ideas? Well, yes, exactly. We plant trees. And what happens is that we actually add life. We add organic matter between the sand. And that holds the sand together. Life is an example of community. Community taking action. Community bringing in something that helps us deal with the sand. And government actually can play a role in this, an active role in getting rid of the desert and creating more life around us, and including community building. Jam is going to talk about open source in government now. Right. So, um, <clears throat> governments, um, instead of just sending their money to wherever outside of their country, um, have some really interesting other choices. Um, let's talk about infrastructure first. If I'm a government and I have a hundred money to spend on improving the life of my citizens, right? I think that should be government's fundamental mission. Um, I can make some choices. I can decide that um, building a bridge across the river at a certain point will allow um, more Tinder dates combining people from either side of the river, um, more deliveries across that bridge, and, and it'll increase commerce, and my population will have better lives because I've spent 100 money on a bridge. This works. This is a reasonable idea. Um, we don't no until we've built the bridge, right? And when the money's spent, it's spent and we're done. Um, a lot of uh, governments will choose to invest in education or medical care to make the lives of their citizens better. I might also choose to invest in vaccinations in another country if I think that improving that country's uh, situation will help my country. And this is a very common international aid um, scheme. It creates dependencies. Right? But it is a legitimate way of, um, that I can choose to spend 100 money to make the world a better place for my citizens. Um, some governments choose to um, spend their 100 money destroying infrastructure in other places. Um, it's not my way, but it is a way to spend 100 money to change something. Depends on what you think about it. Um, if you spend 100 money on open source digital infrastructure, um, you, you have this really crazy set of knock-on effects, like every time somebody uses the solution that I built and open-sourced, it becomes more valuable, right? If I spent 100 money on it and 100 governments are using it, the return on investment is huge, and it can be governments all around the world who are using it. You, well, looked... you can't actually decide to stop it because it's open-source, right? Right, right. So I think, this is a, I think this is an important and under, under understood <laughs> choice. Um, some governments get this really right, some less so. There are a, a lot of open source has gone under the bridge. Yeah. 15 <laughs> minutes, thank you. So there's a, a beautiful, wonderful, I love this example. This is the UK ICT supplier map before the UK digital transformation. What is this, 10, 15 years ago? Before Gov UK. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah. So these dots, you can map them directly onto HP, IBM, Microsoft, and you know, basically London, Reading, 
Brighton, um, at, you know, and it's a few players, but it's all, it's all the big ones, right? This was the ICT suppliers map. Um, and then um, some really, really brilliant people let some other brilliant people um, help, and you can check me on the details because it's been a while, but they changed the government IT procurement processes in several ways. And um, one of them was that they, um, they said that um, for projects under 100 million pounds, I think, uh, that, that, that there was a BM, they would let smaller suppliers register to do, to do projects. Um, they also said that given one-to-one -one feature parity, preference would be given to open source solutions, right? And they created G Cloud, so the mechanisms easily did a few things. But they said if there's equal functionality, look at the open source solution as well. And um, they, did a they did a pilot project um, in a few places, trying out these modalities. Um, it went very, very, very well. And so the UK IT supplier map with enabling SMEs like ours and, and open source, using open source projects, the UK um, supplier map turned into that. And we don't want that, right? Shh. <laughs> <laughs> and it's amazing because all of the tax money, you know, in all of these places was stayed in, in this economy, right? And gave people jobs and gave people opportunities and gave people educational opportunities. And bizarrely, and as a side note, at least five projects went to the European Union. Don't know how that happened. <laughs> but, but, this is a, but this is a great example of, of, of the incredible power of, um, oh, I also have too many clicks here. Um, incredible power of open source solutions, right? Um, and and this, this, this goes on to probably our biggest ideas. It was a dark and stormy night when the telephone rang at this Hypo 3 headquarters. Yep. And we have these kind of story. old telephones. Uh, it's embarrassing. <laughs> but yes, the phone rang. We picked up the phone and it was the government of Rwanda. And they said, dear Typo 3, we have 250 Typo 3 installations. Can you help us upgrade them? And we were like, yeah, sure. Uh, that, that's kind of not what the Type of 3 Association does, but maybe we should find an agency that we could just give it over to. They can go to Rwanda and they can get rich, right? Uh, that's the way things usually work. Like, um, and, you know, companies, they establish a business in a developing country, they earn money and they export all of the money, right? Uh, they come with a closed solution, they give them vendor lock-in, which is a great feature. They create financial dependence between that country and the outside, right? That is colonialist and it's exploitative. The kind of stuff that IT businesses like, right? Well, the Type of 3 Association chose differently. We chose instead to use our community to create independent local business and expertise. That means we talk to our member agencies and they donated people's time. We paid their travel. They went to Rwanda. They brought their expertise into existing agencies in Rwanda that could serve their government. Their government could pay their local agencies for the job. There is a report about it. I also have it in paper version because we're not all online. Um, but it was a really amazing project, click. And this is how it looked. People got to learn about open source. This is how it looks now. They have, they're closing in on 300 websites for everything from local government to the president's office built on four type of three instances that are managed from Rwanda with expertise within Rwanda, money that is paid within Rwanda, paid taxes within Rwanda, and 
you know, if we were to put this in a newspaper headline, it would look something like this. Basically, a democratic and not-for-profit open source project, you know, name any, supports sustainable, independent, local business, right? You can't do that if you're a for-profit business doing a closed source thing, right? Australia. Compare and contrast. Exactly. The Australian government is saying no to building independent democratic structures around public good. Saying no to an open source CMS is saying no to local businesses and taxes. I mean, who would do that? You know, the, 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 what happens is they're actually saying no to building their own country, saying no to democracy, saying no to money. Some civil, Some civil society organizations got uh, the Nobel Peace Prize in 2022, and part of the citation um, was any civil society organization is a training ground for democracy, right? And then another quote uh, talking about the specific laureates, and they, this, the citation closes, together they demonstrate the significance of civil society for peace and democracy, right? Do you want to be a member of an organization that promotes democracy and peaceful coexistence? Become a member of the Drupal Association today, right. yes? And the Type of 3 Association. Yeah, yeah, yeah but... <laughs> yes. so, we, so, very, very briefly, um, Sharon, friend of mine, awesome, runs GovCMS. Um, before GovCMS, in Canberra alone, there were 350 different CMSs running. Um, they... they built a community and a market for their local vendors. Um, people are sharing code. They created a, a government distribution which anti-government activists also use to protest against the Australian <laughs> government. This is a model of success, right? When you're empowering your critics to communicate well too. That's a democracy, right? It's awesome. Um, it's, it's not just sad. There's not just one person right. who can have access to it. And this has been running for, um, I'm not even sure at this point, 10 or 15 years. They estimate that they're saving the government $100 million a year. Um, and um, they've got, you know, they, they, they've, they've created this, or, or, or I don't know, the Australian Drupal community is really vibrant and really awesome. And I think it must be in part due to the fact that, that there's a, a ton of this going on and a ton of people talking about it and a ton of great jobs to be had. So... so. Locally led, non-exploitative, and anti-colonial. That is what we do, but more importantly, what is, what, how do we calculate success? How do we, what's our success indicator in a civil society organization like the Type of 3 Association or the Drupal Association or any other false community? Well, it is community. The growth of our community, the participation in our community is how we measure our success. The more people who contribute, the more countries who have code that they bring into our system, the better our system becomes. And we can even go between systems and say that, well, they did something great in Drupal. We can use that in Type of 3 as well. WordPress did Gutenberg. Some people are doing Gutenberg for uh, Drupal as well. That is how open source works. It's really, really, really great. And it's called community. So what happens next? Um, I got angry. He got inspired. We really think all of this information needs to go out in the world um, and the stories that we've just been telling you. Um, we have to remember the responsibility part around our freedoms. And basically, the values of open source, we know 
because we have to care for our project. We have to be responsible around our project, just as we have to be responsible citizens. The values of open source are the values of a healthy society. If we can't live peacefully together in our community, can we do it in a country? So, democratic values today, they are under attack. But I will say that open source strengthens civil society, our ability to work together everywhere. That is really the strength of open source beyond just the code. We are saving the world. We're cross-border, international communities of practice, um, incredibly diverse, and um, though we should have known better, we haven't always been great at cooperating with each other between projects. Um, that is getting better and better. Uh, Matthias is directly part of the inter-CMS working group, um, to which I have been a peripheral participant. Uh, Drupal, Typo3, uh, Joomla, and WordPress um, got together to write an open letter to the European Union about some of the new software uh, laws that look disastrous that will kill open source. And it looks like they're actually listening to us and um, that we might get a seminar and some time to talk with legislator, uh, legislators coming. Yeah, it's still a question if they're actually listening to us, but this is actually coming back to the thing about talking about open source. What yeah. does your politicians know about open source? Probably very, very, very right. little. And their small ad, we're going to be running a single track um, conference at FOSDEM just an hour from here. Um, next February, talking about all this stuff all day. So please come up to FOSDEM. So at least we hope so. We've submitted it, but it's, yeah. It's, that, now you're suddenly positive and I'm negative. This is, we'll that is very weird. <laughs> yeah. So look, um, to wrap up here, FOSS is special and important and different. And we remember, we need to remember to tell others and evangelize about this. And that if this is a set of pragmatic choices. Whether you want a local economy or a business with a better economic model, it's a, pretty, it's, it's a pretty reasonable thing to look at open source software wherever it makes sense. We should get the Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> <laughs> Telling others about how FOSS works helps us sell more projects and win new developers and um, maybe create some more peace in the world certainly develop local economies and opportunities and lessen exploitation in the world. So please tell your friends, please tell your colleagues, please tell the stories that need to be told. Uh, Matthias and I are also launching a podcast, story, a podcast series to capture all of these anecdotes and stories and talk about them and write about them so that we will all have resources and hopefully not forget these stories and it'll make it easier to pass this on and as you'll we go have forward. to go back to your office in the city because you'll have to listen for longer <laughs> <laughs> right they'll be longer than two and a half minutes now that the pandemic's over so thank you so much for coming uh for coming and listening to us i think we made it just under the wire yeah. Woohoo! all right mm -hmm. <sighs> ricardo has a question yeah that's the yeah, this is actually the question microphone. So this is the answer microphone. Yeah. So, um, okay, you know me. I'm all for this, always. Uh, we even this year in Portugal, we organized our Drupal event inside of the free software uh, festival, let's say. Okay. Um, so, but I, I didn't see in the slides, maybe I missed it, we talking about the Free Software Foundation in Europe, right? Because they have lawyers, right? And they can be a very interesting, at least, ally that it can use and contribute to back, right? What is, you know, what is the converse? Did we try to do that? Uh, did it work? Not? Oh, you have, an you have another one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Because, well, because, you know, these freedoms come from the free software sure. movement. Yes, right? absolutely. Back in the 80s. Absolutely. And I think uh, there are many ways that we can collaborate with, with other organizations. There are a lot of organizations out there who promote uh, open source. The situation right now in the European Union is a little bit difficult. Uh, and there are lots of organizations uh, uh, also, Open Forum Europe, for example, are working uh, to try to turn the EU around re regarding the, the CRA. But what we're seeing is there's a lot of legislation coming up, both in Europe and in the US and in the rest of the world. And it's characterized very often by a lack of knowledge. Often what politicians seem to think is that open source is a charade. It's actually rich, multi-billion dollar businesses standing behind it and uh, let's control them. Yeah. And there are, there are deep, deep difficulties in explaining what is business and what is not business to someone who won't acknowledge um, that we just give our best ideas to each other. Yeah. So community and collaboration are important, but then between the CMSs, I think why we should collaborate? Well, firstly, uh, Drupal, Joomla, Type 3, and WordPress represent more than half of all websites online today, which is a good number to, to give out. Uh, but in the CMS world, we also represent more than just developers. We represent businesses, we represent project managers, we represent writers. We, we're a lot of different people, and that is a strength that we can use in getting the message out. And, and um, I... I feel that some of what's important is slipping through the cracks. The Linux Foundation is the Linux Foundation. The Apache Foundation does really good work, um, like giving a home to the deepest, geekiest, most valuable, weird projects, right? The Electronic Frontier Foundation does a great, uh, uh, does great work on the freedom of speech side. The Free Software Foundation, you know, there's all good work in there. We don't have a unified brand and some concept of talking points or marketing or promoting look i don't know i don't know how many people apple employs 50,000 500,000 i don't know right but these big corporations it, however big they are i think there are more of us creating and maintaining open source software right so it's not, it's not our little two-person shop building websites or something, right? We have 20 years of development behind us in Drupal 25 in, 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 in Typo 3. We're massive. We're, we're underpinning the entire internet. And people don't really know that. And they think that you're just some, how can we trust you? You're not a 50,000-person company. But we don't have that image or that marketing or that unified. So, you know, there's something that's not there yet. And we are you know, volunteer organizations with relatively limited money. That's why you should become a member of the Drupal Association, Type of Three Association, you know, uh, help fund this work. But also one of the reasons why we're collaborating is that we've seen that it doesn't really work there to come and say, hi, I've got Type of Three or I've got Drupal. We're better than that proprietary system. The proprietary system, like what happened in Australia, can come and say, well, we do DXP, or at least we can write DXP in a month and you can get it. You know, they have millions for marketing. They can use that budget to fight open source. So the choice that we're encouraging people to promote is choose open source first over proprietary. There are lots of benefits with open source. Then you can look at solutions, what fits your business best, what can solve your, sol your solutions, where's the expertise, those kind of things. Right. But What's, open source first. Right, and then in different countries, um, some systems are more dominant than others. Do you need a local service provider? All those kind of questions can, can be secondary to the fundamental, in, in our case, the fundamental quality of PHP and the mainline CMSs, right? And we're not a desert. We can look at each other's code. We can be inspired. We can share. Yep. Good question, though. Where's the podcast? <sighs> ah, so, um, 
if you follow us, um, <laughs> well, okay, so okay. If, if you so go, there's another question. Yeah. Um, um, fundamentally, fundamentally, it's 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 going to come out um, under under the Open Strategy Partners mm. umbrella. So follow us somehow. Um, X is such a cesspit right now, and it feels gross to open it. I know, but nobody's given me a blue sky invitation. I need to open up a Mastodon account. Threads isn't available in Europe. I mean, oh, follow me on, follow us on LinkedIn. For yeah. that's how to do it. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, okay. Yeah. Great. And um, yeah, we're 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 well into the planning, and it's looking like a lot of fun. Yeah, and for Open Source Utopia, that's already online, so you yep. can search for it in your favorite podcasting platform. Whew. Yeah. Let's, let's talk. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, wonderful. Thank you so much for coming.